<laughs> Joe Knight. Yes, that's right. Uh, we all were going to have Lauren North. That's what was going to happen. So, yes, right. just so my best wishes to Lauren. Yeah, yeah. So, Joe, thank you very much indeed. Hi. We worked together um, on this project uh, for a year or so now, which is really nice. Uh, and you're down from um, the South Cumbria end, and mm -hmm. you're the quality service improvement facilitator, I think, in, in your area. That's so, right. That's and right. You've, you've asked me today to talk through some practical tips um, about how to improve continuity of care. Um, and so for, for this session, for our 20 minute slot on this one, we're going to look at the uh, model for improvement very briefly. Um, five top tips that are both mine and Lauren's from Western Supermare at Peer Health, another project site. So they're not just my top tips, they are um, other project site top tips as well. And they're common ones that, that we share. Um, and then also we're going to take some questions. If you don't have any questions out there that you can post on the chat, um, then I'm sure Mark has some questions for me as well. So I'm just going to take you through um, a short slide set um, that will help kind of explain some of those top tips. So first of all, the model for improvement is a really good guide for when anybody is making improvements and um, improving continuity of care is no different. It's a really simple model that takes you through three questions. So what are you trying to accomplish, that aim? And so like Dennis mentioned before, it might be what is your practice looking to do? Is it about continuity with GPs or with other specialist areas? Is it all of your um, cohort of patients in your practice? Um, also, the next question is, how, do you want, how are you going to know that your change has made an improvement? So it's really important to take those measures. Um, and later on, we're going to hear about uh, measuring continuity and how we're doing that with this programme. And the third question is, what changes can we make that will result in the improvement that we seek? So they may be change ideas that you learn from this programme. They may be change ideas from within. Um, I saw on the chat that somebody from Birmingham University is also looking into this as well. So any kind of learning that we can gain from other places is also great. But not everything kind of transposes from one area to another. So it's important that we test out those ideas. So whatever ideas that you come with or you learn learn from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. It's important to do that as part of a test cycle. Uh, we recommend the Plan Do Study Act, the PDSA cycle. So all of the, the model for improvement and many other uh, quality improvement resources and guidance is available um, from QSO website. So that's also on this slide set. Um, and like us in South Cumbria, where we have a, a five-day training course that's free for anybody in our Morecambe Bay Integrated Care Partnership to attend, there are many other trainers who also um, deliver CUSA training. And so you can go onto the CUSA website, have a look at their yearbook in there, which is due to be updated in January, or you can email the ACT Academy. The email address is on there also. Um, so you might be able to tap into some quality improvement training in your area as well. So as you said, we're a year in um, and we, have, we are no by, by no means least finished. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still learning, um, but in combination with Lauren at Western Supermare, um, that we have dis kind of come up together some kind of joint learning that we found so far on our five um, top tips, which are to have a clear plan, to look at what you've already got in your practice, to get your staff on board, to involve patients and to start small and build up. And I'm just going to take you through each one of those and try and bring in some examples from South Cumbria that we've used. So first of all, having a clear plan is really important and to articulate that clear plan as well, you need to decide on what you aim to achieve and how you, and when you want to achieve it by. And you can go big, you can go small, you can go to a certain area of your practice or certain individuals within your practice, um, but it's also important how you're going to measure it, how you're going to know you've made that difference. And then who are you going to involve? How are you going to um, um, involve different people in the practice? How are you going to make them aware? How are you going to involve patients? And to what level are they going to contribute to your um, project and your improvement? And it's really important to share that so everybody is understanding of what's happening and can be involved. I think for me, having a clear plan and that aim is really important because as you um, start to make changes, if they're not then meeting your aim, you need to take a second look at it again yeah. and make sure that you're doing that. Um, in South Cumbria, we have five practices in our first wave. Um, 
I'll go back to that in our, in our first wave and each of them are slightly doing something slightly different in each one. So our model in South Cumbria is to use quality improvement techniques and each one has um, a different goal that they're hoping to achieve and that is driven by the practice, what commitment they can make um, and how different those practices are. So you think in one particular area most uh, kind of rural practices that will all be very similar all using the same systems but no they are very different not one size fits all so having that clear plan and that aim for each individual practice is really important for yeah. us Looking at what you've got is also really key. Um, improvement shouldn't be a bolt-on. They need to be part and parcel of what you do for them to be maintained and to be sustainable. So it's good to look at your processes that you've already got. Um, there on the picture you will see a process map. That's a really good way of having a look visually at what you do. That particular one is an appointment booking process system. Um, and you'll be able to identify opportunities that you can reduce waste, increase your uh, efficiencies in there but also look for opportunities where continuity can happen within those processes. Also looking at what you've got, use your resources, use your staff, those on the front line are really key in terms of generating those different ideas of how they can make improvements. You're more likely to get them to change if, they're, if it's their ideas and they're owning them. And also adapting ideas from the outside, so from this programme, um, being able to access the Basecamp forum, um, which you can access through the RCGP continuity website. Yep and hear about what's going on from elsewhere, but then you can adapt those ideas to work for you and your practice. Our third step is about getting your staff on board. It's really important to listen and un to understand where they're coming from, to hear their concerns, for them to say what benefits continuity will bring to them and, and for them to kind of articulate that and for everybody to be on the, on the same kind of path together. Um, it's important to engage them so that more things are sustainable. If you've involved them and they're aware of what's happening and they, they take some ownership, you are more likely to be successful with any change or project. And also keeping those informed. So you might not necessarily involve everybody to a greater degree, but it's important that everybody is aware of what is happening. And often people think that when you inform others and you're trying to get everybody involved that it takes longer. And, and yes, it probably will take a little bit longer, but your change will be faster and more likely to, to be maintained as well. And use different ways that you already kind of access your staff. So there's a, a little diagram there to kind of say around how you can use existing meetings. In South Cumbria, we have um, protected learning time afternoons once a month. So we utilise those around a focus on content continuity um, and also kind of training and other opportunities for staff and even just the, the chit chat that you have at break times and things like that will also kind of help in terms of getting your staff on board. Our fourth step is about listening to patient experiences. In South Cumbria, we have chosen to run some focus groups and it really is enlightening to see that different perspective um, and get that greater understanding from what patients um, have experienced. And, and particularly for that practice as well, what I've found is when I've talked to patients, what I believe was happening in the practice is very much reflective in what the patients are experiencing. And it's a really good, good way to identify problems and ideas because they will say what challenges they face at your practice. Um, using patient stories is really powerful. That will help to support your rationale for change. It will also help to um, kind of sway people to, you know, as a, as a GP, how could you kind of not... Um, kind of react to a yeah. patient's story and right. um, you might think it's going really well in your practice and then you hear patient stories that tell you otherwise and how can you not listen and want to change that so that's that's also really important and you might also choose to use patient words for your future communication like we're doing in South Cumbria so we plan on using some of the quotes from the focus group to put it in patient words to help promote continuity and you can cover, um, kind of get patients' experiences from a range of different ways, depending on how much time you have, from a simple question box um, that you place in your um, reception area, asking them what does continuity of care mean to them. Yep. Um, and also you can um, go as far as we have gone in providing focus groups. You don't need very many, um, and a small group is, is enough, but some time to be able to dedicate to that. Our fifth 
Um, and final tip is to start small and to build up. So small tests are really easy to do. Um, you're able to kind of undo them if they aren't working really well. And it's about kind of that pace of change as well and being as short and snappy and learning from it quickly. People are happier to try smaller changes and to be engaged. And you can also, when you're learning from those um, short changes, it builds that evidence for your practice to kind of make sure that everybody is on board. There's less risk and you can also test it under different conditions. So where something that would work somewhere else comes into your practice, you're, you're testing it under your conditions and all of our practices are looking at kind of those small test cycles mm. and doing it in that way. Okay, so, so that completes my five tips um, and as I said before you've, you've probably got some questions for me and I don't know if we've had some um, other ones in, in, the, in the chat box as well. We've got uh, want some come in so I might just ask that in a, in a second. Um, but for me, the, 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 when we started talking about this a, a while ago, um, uh, the message changed, it became the importance of building up the team mm -hmm. and the, this sort of basis of quality improvement, just building the team up. And then you can build on that the continuity of care issue. You know, and, and that's quite important, for, I think. That's the message that's coming out here. Um, and also that there are other resources you can use, leaflets and um, uh, letters, uh, messages for the phone and things like that, which hopefully will become available through the websites and RCGP. But the basis is building up from the the bottom of the team and where you are. Yeah, I yeah. think it's about making sure that your processes are conducive to um, continuity. So whilst you might promote continuity through leaflets and your answer phone message, if you are not able to deliver it, you have increased somebody's expectations and then they are unmet. So it's really important not only to, to provide those benefits, but enable to cope with that continuity uh, requests that come in from your patients. Yeah. So I will uh, dive into one of the questions that's come in and it will go on. The um, uh, question here says, uh, should patient expectations of continuity of care be the same across all practices, um, it says here England, but the UK actually, isn't it, we'll think of. Uh, if practices are approaching this at an individual level, can we set an expectation for all? I think I know the answer from what you've just said, but do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I think for, for us, I think we could, couldn't say that all of our practices could deliver it in the same way. And yeah. every practice experiences different challenges and different areas and different asks from their, from their patients. I think for, for anybody exploring improving their continuity, it isn't about achieving 100% continuity. Um, like somebody mentioned around specialist areas and then you might want to see different clinicians, but it's about improving it and working to towards a, a better level of continuity for individual practices. Yeah. And so, also, uh, yeah. yeah, and you were saying about working out where your practice is and then mm -hmm. we're working on from that basis mm -hmm. rather than diving in and saying you must do continuity from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there's been um, some headlines really about name GPs uh, and so Dennis mentioned about uh, the name GP approach. Mm -hmm. um, but in the BMJ article recently, the headline was that name GPs don't improve continuity of care. And I was a bit sort of shocked by that. And I, but I think there's more to it than that. I don't know whether you could expand on that. Yeah, so I mean, nothing, having a name GP alone wouldn't improve continuity of care. And also having a name GP, um, depend, if it's very different to the person that you have already been seeing and have built a relationship up with that GP, would kind of take you away from that continuity as well. So uh, having a name GP of somebody that you have usually been seeing and having that patient list and, and building up that continuity is a good starting point. But you've got to build in kind of opportunities and to make it easy for your patients to achieve that continuity within your practice. So that alone is definitely not enough, but is a good place to start. Yeah, and you almost have to do the name GP bit to start off, don't you, in a, in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I think there was a really good letter in reply to that article from the Exeter team which uh, talked about that very issue and, and the fact it's a starting point. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, do you think it needs to be part of the team or the whole team that's involved in, in this uh, uh, development of continuity within a practice? I think it would depend on the practice and how much time that you've got to commit um, to making that change and what your aim is as well. Is it about looking at a certain group of patients or a certain numbers of staff? I think it's really important that you get that wide awareness across all of your practice so that everybody is, is aware of what's going on, but you might involve only small pockets of the team, um, but it is entirely up to you. The more that you involve, the bigger, the faster the change it can be, um, but you can take it at your own pace.
Mm. And when we talked a bit before, you we were saying how um, you can have um, a part of the team working on it, but it's good to communicate with all the rest of the team about what yes. they're doing. So you're raising awareness right across the team, even though a little bit of the team's working on it, mm -hmm. doing small and building up, as you said. Yeah. Um, so uh, what do you think uh, motivates a GP to get involved with continuity of care? Because there's a sort of what tips the balance and gets the GP on side um, is, the, is the question that comes from, from my mind. Um, have you got any comments about that? Um, well, any kind of resistance or kind of um, trying to get somebody else on board, you've got to kind of be able to say what's in it for me. What are the benefits to any scepticism that is, is arriving and, and you're faced with? Um, so it would be understanding those benefits. Dennis has taken through um, quite a lot of evidence base in terms of those benefits. But I'd be asking the question back to the GP, you know, when you do see the same patient, what benefits do you see? So, Mark, you'd probably be better answering this question than me as a GP no so so what benefits would you see yeah. that would um, that yeah. would kind of motivate you it's amazing because because what I find is that is that joy of knowing the patient and being able to start further forward um, and then I, I'm I think oh, I know this person I'm there I can actually deal with all the problems in one go and I might have in my mind four or five problems mm -hmm. but I know I can get them through fairly quickly and also I know how to relate to that person and, and what response they have, you know, whether they want to have, be told or whether they want to listen or discuss. It's, mm -hmm. it's, this really makes a difference to me for the continuity. Yeah. And, and many of our GPs in South Cumbria, some have um, mentioned about how seeing the tests that they've requested or is for their patient is much a easier to act upon and to yeah. process um, that um, reading your own notes and recognising the thought process that you went to when you wrote those notes is much easier than reading somebody else's notes. Yeah. And just feeling that there are efficiencies in terms of kind of how quickly you recognise that person. Um, yes, there may be periods of time where you don't see them for a while, but reading your own notes is very different to reading somebody else's. It is, yeah. And, and we're talking about relational continuity often here, but of course there's informational continuity and there's management continuity, so there's mm -hmm. other things to think about when you're talking about continuity isn't there yeah, yeah. And, and, and often what we found in South Cumbria is when we've looked at processes having a reflective name GP of who your patient is usually seeing is also great for all of those workflow elements in the background where staff are often looking through notes to understand who is the best person to send that to whereas if it is very reflective it's a lot quicker for them to find and, and kind of allocate that to the right person in the practice yeah. So we've got an outside question here. Is, um, is there a greater role for the admin team who often have a lot of contact with patients, um, thinking of the receptionist role in particular? Um, I, I find that I work quite a lot with the admin team. Mm. Um, certainly the admin teams in the five practices that we have, they are very much aware of what goes on in the practice. Uh, patients will tell them exactly how they feel about not being able to see their same GP or not being able to get an appointment. Whereas I think the time is very precious in a GP consultation, patients won't air that type of thing. So. Um, admin team are definitely um, better placed in terms of helping that um, improving the continuity yeah. at your practice. Um, I'm not sure in terms of what greater role other than kind of that involvement the, the question is pertaining to. So so um, oh. if you want to add to it then, um, then please it's interesting that, yeah. And I, I think the thinking about it, a reception is also about signposting and, and asking the patient who their usual doctor is and, and moving it forward. So I suppose that's quite important as well, isn't it? Yeah, um, in. The, and in terms of your appointment process, they are that guide, aren't they, to, to signposting you to the right person. So you may not ask who your GP is, you may not kind of reveal that in terms of your requesting an appointment, but if the, the admin team are aware of it, they can certainly signpost you to that person. Yeah, and I'm always amazed how the reception team um, get a different viewpoint. It's like a, a different patient comes into the door to see me because they say things differently, but they'll, with the reception team, they might be quite open and honest and forthright mm -hmm. yeah, about it. Okay, so we've got one more question here, I think, got time for. Um, what do you think the impact of online booking is, uh, or will be, as the proportion of patient appointments available online, unfiltered and unworked flowed, it says here, increases? 
I think that's where um, knowing who your usual GP is is really important when you're online booking. Um, there is a particular a small practice in South Cumbria that I've been working closely with and um, the people who were part of the focus group said that they achieved their own continuity. It was very much patient-led. They always used online booking but they knew who they were looking for. Yeah. So I think online booking won't deter from continuity as long, but it's very much putting it into the patient's hands to maintain that continuity and to understand those benefits and kind of motivate them to be able to achieve that continuity as well. So it definitely can help, but it could also hinder if patients don't know who their, their usual GP is and don't see the benefit of seeing that same GP. Yeah, and that emphasises the importance of bringing the patients on side, which is one of your, your five tips here mm -hmm. um, so you, you know our tips the the fact you should have a clear aim and plan that um, you should start where the patient is at or the practice is at rather mm -hmm. involving the staff isn't it um, involving the patients um, and then um, working small um, and coming on from and building up yeah. I think when those were, it's you... much more easier and less overwhelming to, to start small and to build up and the last tip, I think I might add, is to congratulate yourself when you get there and to say, well done, uh, and um, how far you've done, because I think that's the important thing. So I've, I've learned it's achievable, we can do it, we can increase continuity, um, and it has clear benefits, we've known from the previous mm -hmm. session. Um, and now I think we move on to think about uh, looking at the feedback to see whether you've actually achieved continuity. So uh, thank you very much indeed you. for your, your help.